Beautiful evening, and uh, it's nice to see all of you here. Uh, so tonight, uh, as I mentioned to you last time we met, uh, we have a uh, very interesting talk on cervical cancer screening in Africa with Grounds for Health. And our the speaker tonight is Joey Banks. Uh, Joey is a uh, family medicine doc, uh, works at the Blue Mountain Clinic. Um, she does reproductive care and family medicine. She was a Peace Corps volunteer in Ghana with her husband in the early 1990s, and she's also worked in Kenya and Cameroon during her medical training. Uh, she recently lived in Tanzania for three years working and raising her family, and I have a feeling that we're going to hear about Tanzania to some extent. Some extent. So, Joey, welcome. All right, if you have a little pink piece of paper, um, and they're, they're floating around. If not, you can take any little pink piece of paper. Write your, your first name's fine, but write your name on it, and then secretly write, um, uh, write what you think the number one reason for, for missionary workers or public health workers or um, uh, people like me that go over to Africa to do work in hospitals, um, social workers that go over to Africa working for USAID, what's the number one reason that they die? And I say that because I do tons of travel medicine. So people come in and they ask me for malaria medicines and for their anti-diarrheals. And we have big long talks about do they soak their clothes in, in permethrin before they go. So write down, what do you think that, it's gonna be you, one of you, that's traveling and doing work overseas, and I'm using Africa just because that's where I've worked the most. Um, what's the number one thing I'm going to talk to you about to prevent you from serious injury or death? You know, because um, you want your malaria meds and you want your anti-diarrheals and and all of that. And we want to talk about do you need your typhoid shot or your yellow fever shot? But write down what you think the reason is, and then we'll talk about that in a little bit. And that's just me being the travel consult doctor to some of you may, who may choose to work overseas some in the future. So um, I'm going to talk about cervical cancer screening, but I'm not really going to talk about cervical cancer screening. So those of you that are in the course got the syllabus ahead of time and were able to read some about grounds for health some about cervical cancer, some about how cervical cancer is screened and treated. Those of you that are not in the course, don't worry, we do a five minute little quick and easy, uh, literally five minutes, everything you need to know about HPV and cervical cancer, okay? But what I really wanna do is have you look at whatever you may choose to work for in the future, whatever cool project that someone emails you and says, hey, I got this project in Costa Rica or this project in Ethiopia, and here's the organization, and we're looking for someone to do this type of work. I want you to kind of say, like, do I have the tools to figure out, is that something I want to do? Is that the mission for me? Is that the way to go? Is it a good mission at all? Is it, is it, is it not for me? And so that's what I want you to get out of this, is not just, oh, what did Joey do when she was in Tanzania around cervical cancer, okay? Um, so uh, we went to Tanzania, East Africa. I lived in Arusha. Um, this is Joe Fortier, a nurse practitioner, who was my mentor when I first started uh, reproductive care um, 15 years ago. And she was kind of my teacher and mentor. And she actually came over while I was in Tanzania and worked for Grounds for Health also at the same time so that we could see each other and, and be together. And this is us doing sundowners, probably, which is a term that we used a lot where when the sun sets, we'd go out and my kids always said, mom and dad drink wine and we get cheese. So that's what we did for sundowners. 
And just to remember the map, if you can't remember the map uh, of where Tanzania is, um, the particular grounds for health project I worked out was near Moshi, um, which is right next to Kilimanjaro, and it's where the main international airport in Tanzania is. And there's my family, and the main reason we went to Tanzania was simply because my husband works for the Nature Conservancy. He's the Africa Director for the Nature Conservancy, and so after three to four years um, of really long commute from Alaska, uh, we chose to move over to Africa for three years. And um, now the Nature Conservancy is in nine countries, and he's back here doing the long commute again. Um, but that's because it's the, the long commute is a long commute anywhere in Africa, too. So if he's going from Zambia to uh, Arusha, that takes just as long as if he's going from Arusha to Amsterdam. Um, so um, the funniest question right now I just want to throw out to people that are travelers. You know, we get a lot of questions right now about, I'm going to Kenya, but I'm worried about Ebola. And I always say, remember highways. So Liberia to Kenya, you're further away from it than if you're in Amsterdam or London, you know? And so we, we really make Africa small in our heads because that's what we do here in the US. We make everything else really small in our heads. And so just kind of keep that in mind when you're thinking about Africa. That's David and Cole and Birch. And this is Lake Natron where you could see uh, uh, flamingos. And it smelled like it. Like you could see lots of flamingos there. And that's our house. And I always just throw that out because people are like, where did you live? And you know, what was it like? And this time for when we lived this year, we, we lived in a, uh, a community uh, near the international school. Unlike our Peace Corps experience 20 years ago, and unlike my Cameroon and, and um, Kenya experiences where I was doing more medical work, this year, this time we worked and lived kind of in the international community within Tanzania. Uh, we did learn some Swahili. but. Uh, very Kadogo, so I don't, I'm not very good at all. My kids are much better, but we had just kind of a regularish house, you know. Um, and this was a hospital I worked in. It was called a, a Arusha Lutheran Medical Center. Um, and I worked two days a week doing prenatal and ob -GYN, and then I worked um, two days a week doing international medicine through the international school, mostly for the expatriate community. Um, that didn't want to drive into town to go to the medical center. And this is just a typical OB room and um, for delivery. Um, a, a, a lot more simpler than what we do, but we all know you can deliver at your house. So, you know, more, more advanced than that. So. And what we did a ton of was I got to be a mom. And I hadn't been a mom for the last 10 years. So one of the best parts of me going back and doing um, international work is that I could cut my load a little bit. And so I was able to be a mom again for a while. And we safaried a lot. We were very, very fortunate. And this is us on a walking safari. And, um, uh, and then this is how every safari ends, with me in the back seat and both kids completely zonked and us driving from one place to the other. So that's just me and my life there. And I throw those questions out first because people just want to hear that stuff. What did it look like? Where did you live? Did you have a regular house? And especially people who are considering work abroad and haven't made that decision of what type of work they want to do, a million different ways to do it. You can do it Peace Corps like we did it, where we had no electricity, no water, carry the water on our heads to get to the house, blah, blah, blah. Or you can do it. Uh, in an international way and live in a nicer house and have a car that was so nice this time to have my own transportation. Um, so grounds for health. Let's talk about grounds for health. Um, uh, who out there did read a little bit about it? Can anyone summarize it? Did anyone look ahead of time that was part of the class? Or do you not want it to be interactive? We don't have to be interactive. Anyone? Anyone who was part of the class? Okay, grounds for health is a cervical cancer screening program uh, started in Vermont. Um, remember, our goal is to come away how to review grounds for health, not to say this is an organization you should absolutely work for. They believe in cervical cancer screening in Africa, and they believe the way to do it is something called visual 
uh, acetic acid visual um, inspection. So you're looking with your eyes at a woman's cervix for changes on the cervix. And if you see those changes, you are treating immediately with a freezing therapy called cryotherapy. The population they target is through coffee co-ops. So they choose a area that is linked to a coffee co-op, like Kilimanjaro Coffee Co-op. And so they choose that coffee co-op, and they do that for a couple reasons. One, coffee's your second most, com like, com comedy, uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Commodity in the world. And, and so lots of coffee growers, 80% of the workers on coffee plantations are women. Um, it tends to be rural, most cervical cancer in Africa that is untreated and therefore kills people is rural. And because they can link it back to America, to people that want to buy fair trade coffee. So they can help that, that coffee co-op get into the fair trade market. And then most of their donors are around coffee within America. So like um, Keurig Coffee, um, all these people are big donors for them. Um, and they can market to their donor base by using that little fair trade coffee edge. So they picked their population, and it all started with one woman that was working somewhere in um, Central America and noticed that women in rural coffee plantations um, tended to have cervical cancer and die from it. And so someone said, let's fix cervical cancer. And someone else said, okay, how do we do it? Let's hook to coffee corporations. And that's how it started, okay? So let's just do that really quick. Um, HPV. Okay, so this is cervical cancer 101 in two minutes. Um, anyone who has sex with anyone gets HPV, right? And there are over 100 different strains of HPV, and anyone who has sex with anyone who has sex with anyone gets HPV. The cool part is 80% of the time our body clears it completely on its own without us having to do anything. Okay, so it's only this 20% that doesn't clear that sometimes we have to watch to make sure in the next 10 years it doesn't turn into cervical cancer. Not next year or tomorrow, but in the next 10 years. So HPV clears, or if it doesn't, it starts to change the cells on, we're going to talk about cervix only tonight, on the cervix of women to make them cancer or precancer. The way we look for that here in the USA is to do a pap smear. And for men that have never had a pap smear, that's like doing a throat swab with a Q-tip, but instead on your cervix. We send that pap smear and they look under the microscope and they can say, are the cells changing or not changing? And they can also DNA test that for the virus HPV and tell you if you have the two highest strains, 16 or 18. If the test is abnormal, in the USA we do a colposcopy, which is a fancy, big, tall microscope that in my clinic we call Wally, -E, and it, we put it right up to the vagina and I look really close at the cervix and I can say, are their cells changing? And if so, can I take a pinch or a biopsy of them and send them to the lab? So the lab can tell me, is it definitively changing cells or not? And if they're changing cells, I can freeze or cut the cervix to prevent that from turning into cancer 10 years down the road. Everybody got it, HPV 101, right? Now we know that. So this is for the men, just reminding everybody anatomy, what the heck is the cervix? Because when my son just recently did sex ed, he thought this, he knew the cervix word, he knew the uterus word, but he somehow connected to the ovaries right away, and then he kind of put pubic hair out here, like when he drew the picture. So we know it, but we don't know it. The cervix is just the bottom part of that uterus, and here's the vagina. And so I also brought this in because a lot of people don't understand when I'm talking about cervical cancer screening that in order to look at the uterus and the bottom part of the uterus, the cervix, through the vagina, we need to use this instrument called a speculum, or duck, whatever you want to call it. People call it duck bill or people call it speculum. And so we're looking here through the speculum at that cervix. And if you look at the cervix, it looks just like a button, just like this. So that's what I'm seeing when I look inside a woman's vagina, trying to decide if there are abnormal changes.
Okay, and the reason we're doing this is so you understand. If you don't understand the basics of that, you don't know if Grounds for Health is an organization you want to work for or not. If you don't even understand how do they do what they're doing. So this is how we do a colposcopy. So here's my large machine called Wally in my clinic that's just a really big magnifying glass. Look in to the vagina through that speculum, see that button-sized cervix, decide if there are changing cells, okay? If there are, then I cut or freeze the cervix on another visit to help stop that from progressing to cancer. And that's kind of the colposcope, normal cervix, abnormal cervix. These are just drawings and a reminder of that. So now you kind of get the picture, okay? So Grounds for Health, they say, look, we've got this coffee cooperative. We're going to work with the local health systems. We're going to do technical assistance training and equipment supply in order to do cervical cancer screening, uh, cervical cancer um, screening by a way different than they do in the USA. We're not going to take biopsies and get pathology reports and do coposcopes or even do pap smears because there aren't enough pathologists or laboratories to do pap smears. And so one way of doing this is simply a doctor says, I'm going to fix cervical cancer in Arusha, Tanzania, and goes over and lines up 500 women that were lucky enough to come to clinic that day, screens every one of them, takes those pap smears back home to America, a doctor here reads them, sends the results back six months later, then we try to go out into the villages, find those people, bring them back in to treat. Okay? Even though we know maybe by that time some of them have cleared. So do we retest them again because it's been so long? So that's one way screening has been done. A lot of the local governments are really starting to come up with screening programs. In the bigger cities, some of the hospitals, like Moshi, can do LEAP, can do pathology, can do biopsies. Um, a lot of the local governments are trying to collect their own pap smears, bring them back. Um, but the numbers are too great right now for Tanzania's health system to be able to maintain screening women. In America, we screen starting at age 21. We don't want one person out of a million people to maybe get cervix cancer. In Europe, they screen at age 30 and on. The recommendation in Africa from most countries like Tanzania, Kenya, Ethiopia is age 30 and on unless you have HIV. And that's because HIV sp speeds up the progression of cervical cancer. So instead of clearing or instead of taking 10 years to go from pre-cancer to cancer, it can happen much more quickly. Okay? We know in Tanzania the rate of HIV is about 9 to 11 percent. So that's 9 to 11 percent of the female population that is going to have a greater rate at, at sped up progression of HPV to cervical cancer or non-clearing as compared to the non-HIV population. Um, so here's how we do it again. Here's how we train people in this program, Grounds for Health, to do it with visual acetic acid inspection. It's actually called VIA, visual inspection with acetic acid. This is how we do it here. That's how I do it there. I put my reading glasses on and I get really, really close, right up to the cervix, right up to the vagina, as close as I can, and I use my eyes to decide. I don't have the big fancy microscopes because those have lots of little parts, get broken very easily, are hard to transport from one village to the next, and are very expensive. So we get really, really close. There are people out there inventing little small coposcopes that you can just hold with a hand. And, and some of that's already out there already. Um, it's still, still lots of little tiny parts and things get broken and dropped and they're hard and expensive to replace. So reading glasses are not. And we would take a whole bunch of reading glasses from Walmart with a big chart and we would train first um, any woman that we were training, we would line up first and we'd do the reading glasses chart. And because the 
the villages that we worked with got to choose, their, the communities got to choose who they wanted to put forth for the training. Sometimes it was a nurse, sometimes it was a midwife, sometimes it was someone's best friend because that's who was gonna get to do it. It was all different education levels, all, but a lot of them were older because they'd become at that level where now they were respecting the community, we want you to do the training, but that meant their eyes were much like mine and my husband's when we go to dinner all the time. Um, and that's how I feel like Cafe Dolce should keep a little pair of glasses right at the front that says for Joey when she comes in because I cannot remember ever uh, to bring my glasses. And as you can see, here's one of our trainees plus Ellen who is our director of the um, project this time. And, and that trainee is actually looking at a test on how to tell what's normal and abnormal cervix. Here's me in one of the exam rooms. It's really hot there, just so you know. Um, and uh, uh, this is a colposcope. So here's a nitrogen, a liquid nitrogen gas tank, a tube linked to a little gun that then freezes the cervix. So it has a little piece on the end of the gun that you put to the cervix and it freezes the cervix. None of the windows had curtains, so we had to provide conga for curtains. And then we, we needed ventilation, because if you stood in a room with this tank for a long period of time, some of it seeps out and you can get a lot of liquid nitrogen yourself that you're breathing in. So another tube goes out through the window, through the open window, um, in order to let gas out. So we have to train everyone not on just how to look at a cervix and decide if it's normal or not normal, but for some people we had to train how to even put a speculum in. For some people, they already knew that. They were midwives. They were better at me than speculum exams. But we needed to explain HPV and what it was and why the connection to HIV and that having HIV, HPV was in no way HIV because there was a lot of stigma about HIV even though the two ran together. So a lot of times it was education on that and then we also had to train how the heck do you use this machine? You know, how do you use it? How do you turn it on? How do you make sure it's working? How do you know you're getting a good freezing temperature? Um, and then how do you take all of this and sterilize it? So from the very beginning step one to step 400, little tiny steps on how to treat, how to screen for and treat for cervical cancer by using visual inspection. The interesting thing is the chemical we use for that is just old vinegar. So vinegar on a cervix, cells that are changing will glow. And so at least that's easy to get. We got vinegar. This gas, a little bit harder to get, but you can get it. The instrument, the coposcope, I mean the um, cryo gun, way harder to get. Very technical in tiny little parts trying to keep it together. Okay, but the idea is let's not go through the whole like wait for your pap smear to get back and then biopsy and then treat. Let's just say if we look and we see it, let's treat. What does that mean? This means we're going to treat a lot of people that don't need it. And it means we're going to miss a lot of people who do have it, but we call it wrong with our eyes, right? But is it better than nothing for some of these women? You know, and so that's the thought I want you to kind of think. Or is there a better way to do it than what Grounds for Health is doing? World Health Organization likes VIA. They support VIA starting at age 30 and screening every three years with VIA if pap smear is not available or HPV testing not available. Okay, so they like it. Barriers, your location itself, right? What do we use for privacy? So what do we use for privacy? We were hanging congas at the beginning of every session. Sterility, how do we make instruments clean and sterile afterwards? There's my clinic, it's easy. I take the 12 speculums, I put them in a little machine, I turn it on, they come out all clean. You know, here it's six or seven bucket soaks, different soaks, certain chemicals. Why do we be, have to be extra cautious? You know, we know the rate, 9 to 12% HIV, depending where you are in Tanzania. Where do we get the instruments from? 
So we had this great company that said, oh, we'll donate tons and tons of plastic speculums. But then are we just filling the landfills in Tanzania the same way we would here with less resources for destruction of waste? Or do we say, no, we want metal speculums, but that means you have to go through the sterility. And how are we going to do that in every single small village you go to? How do you get the gas from one place to the other? They got the gas. What do you do when the roads close for six months because of the rainy weather? Or what do you do if the truck driver's mom gets sick? You know, there's lots of things that, that, that stop this gas from getting to where it needs to go for treatment. And the idea of Grounds for Health is, I look today, if you're abnormal, I treat you today. You know, that's a great idea. Okay, and actually freezing treatment has very little true severe complication risk associated with it, except for that sometimes it doesn't work, and maybe that woman can't get back, or sometimes they get vaginal discharge, smell, or increased bacteria, and now this whole team that was there has moved on, so who treats that? Sometimes there's the stigma associated with you were the one being treated, do you really have HIV? Because I know they were looking at HIV women there too, you know, so there's a lot of stigma around that. Travel, these women traveled for this project and alone, traveled sometimes a whole 24 hours just to get to the place they could be screened. Um, so lots of barriers. Anyone else think of any other barriers in a place like this through work that they've done that seems similar? Somebody? Awareness, excellent. Who ever said that? Good, ching, ching. Yes, because, yeah, how do you get people to even come? How do you get them to say, oh, yeah, I need cervical cancer screening? You know, you, put, you say that word HPV instead of pap smears, and they hear sometimes HIV, because that's what they've been hearing for the last 10 or 15 years from a lot of not-for-profit organizations there to help. Yeah, awareness. Lots of stuff. How do we house the trainees? How do we house the trainees that are of different educational levels? So some villages would send people that had been through full secondary school, long-term midwives. Some villages would send someone who much lower on the socioeconomical scale. So there was a little diversity there. And how did we make them a team? Because they were all going back out to their regular places too. How do we choose from all those people which are going to be the main, quote, treatment villages and get the cryo gun? You know, how do we work with a government that wants to do all of this on their own, but unfortunately doesn't have the finances right now? Do we work with them to say this is the right way to doing it, do it? Or do we not work with them and we just go in and do our little save some people and walk out work? Yeah, I don't know. Um, so, is this Grounds for Health a good mission? I did it because my mentor called and said, let's do this project. I said, fine, I'll go. You know, I'm here anyway. And, and uh, why is it a good cause? Well, cervical cancer is one of the easiest cancers to detect, treat, and cure. That's why we don't see it here anymore. So that's the part that pulled at my heartstrings is, why do women in Tanzania have to die of cervical cancer when it is so easy to screen for, treat, and cure? Why are women still dying of something that easy? You know, I see tons of work going into Tanzania's government right now on stopping diabetes and, and cardiac health that are new diseases within the male population of Tanzania, mostly due to soda and Yamachoma and fried things. So, you know, but pulled away from something that's been here forever and here, I'm constantly telling women, I don't need to treat you. Give it another year. I don't need to treat you. Give it another year. You're going to clear. So, but in Zambia, VIA based screen and treat prevents one cervical cancer for every 46 women who are HIV positive if they're even just screened once not even every three to five years. That's kind of a big number. 
So that kind of pulled at me a little bit. And then when I look at the difference between the cases and the deaths per 100,000 women in the US versus Sub-Saharan Africa, that pulls at my heartstrings. Well, so then I went a little bit further. Because I was like, well, I'm still, I still think it's pretty small and big scale. Come on, malaria, HIV, blah, blah, blah. Deaths from cervical cancer, 32 per 100,000 in Tanzania. That's more than I thought. And that deaths from malaria right now, deaths from malaria right now, 21,000 per 100,000. The majority of those uh, less than eight years old. And so that, I, I, I would have thought that malaria number was way up here and that my cervix camper number was down, down there. And so I'm kind of surprised by that. Tons more mortality, morbidity, I mean, around malaria, like people that are sick and compromised for life, education, all of that. Deaths from septic abortion in Tanzania right now, 33 per 100,000 a year. So people that are choosing to abort on their own Schools days missed from periods, 30% of a year, and 4 to 30% dropout rate sometimes because of just missing that amount of school for women, especially in the more uh, traditional Muslim areas of Tanzania. So it made cervical cancer not look as small as I thought it was. So I, so I was more OK with the project itself. All right, I was more OK with the project itself. But I kept saying, is there a better way than the way we're doing it? Because I don't know how they're going to keep getting these gas things. And I'm not sure that the women we're training vision is really as good. And we're going to train this one village, but then we might never go back. Are we expecting them to train the next person? Are we going to keep coming back and training the younger generation? So I wasn't quite sure this is the answer or the organization to do it with, even though I went and participated. And the reason I chose this slide, is there a better way, is because I always think of these tiny little sea turtles. And they're, they're big mama turtles, you know, bury them and the eggs way up on the shoreline. And then we have to block all that off, and we, those little turtles have to make their way. And we know that all the birds are coming down and getting them, and they can hardly make their way. And I so desperately just want to pick up that little turtle and get it out there to the water and put it in so it can go, and it doesn't work. They find that when you do them, they tag those turtles, they don't work if they don't live. You know, there's something about them having to get there on their own that works better than us just picking up all those turtles and moving them out to the ocean and letting them go. There has to be a better way. So what do I think about? Well, I think, should we be instead investing money on HPV testing? Because if we can make that a really simple test, maybe we would be basing treatment on simply do you have 16 or 18, the two HPVs that tend to progress the most. And if you have, freeze those women, or VIA just those women. I don't know. Do we, do we really start way back? So right now there's one physician in Tanzania for every 20,000 people. In the US, in order to make money as a physician, you have to have a population of 2,000. Many of us have less, some have more. But one per 20,000, and that's all specialties. So maybe what we really need to do is find a way to find more physicians, more pathologists, more gynecologists, more family physicians that can do this within their own country rather than just go in and screen women. You know, do we start way, way back? Do we develop better and cheaper vaccines? So we, there's a vaccine, there's a number of vaccines right now. Uh, a new one's coming out that has nine strains. Um, they cost here in America, if you're paying cash, about 320 per vaccine. They're on a zero, two month, six month schedule. And that's hard for people to get into, especially if you live rurally. And they're cold, they need the cold, they need refrigeration. So do we instead not do any of this screening stuff and put all the money and investment into better vaccines? And then when do you start the vaccine? Here we say 11 or 12 or before the first sex act. But we know in Tanzania specifically that there's a higher rate of sex um, within the family, unfortunately, less than age 13. So are we starting at age eight? You know, I don't, we don't know the answers, but is that where we should be going? Should we only be screening HIV women? I, I don't know. Some people say that's probably the population that 
is going to progress to cervical cancer the most, they're probably the people who need the screening the most, but then what do you do for the women that don't have HIV? Do we work on spending money on smaller guns, the little cryo guns, so it's not a big DAS unit, but some way to treat smaller and easier? You know, so much technology, the possibilities there. Do we educate more on screening? Is that where all my money should go? Is going into the schools and saying every woman should be screened or teaching school nurses to do basic screening and if at least if there's an abnormal, refer them then to someone who can do a more advanced VIA screening? Anybody have the answer? What do you think? Um, you probably didn't hurt anyone. Right. Probably doesn't hurt anyone. You probably help some people. The other side of this coin, and this is a heartless, hard to say side, but by little tiny NGOs like Ground for Health coming in and helping a few people in a few countries, in a few villages, does then that government not need to take the responsibility and step forward? and start educate, working on their education system so that more people graduate through high school, through college, become MDs, their MD population goes up, they figure out their own way to screen women. And so there are some people that work very closely with some of the governments that say, are we enabling in a way that we shouldn't enable, or is this the right thing to do? I don't know the answer. I'm still conflicted myself. So, what I want you to go away with is tools. And we've got about 20 minutes to talk about tools when you look at something for grounds for, like Grounds for Health. So before I go on to tools, tell me who has questions about what Grounds for Health's mission is, how you, any other questions about HPV or how they actually do it? Yeah. How are they reaching out to those women who are traveling 24 hours to get, I mean, I know that they're doing it kind of through the coffee. That's what I was going to say. That's what. Getting still, even reaching out to them through the coffee club and getting to travel that far would be, seems like even it would be a real challenge. It was. It really, they go, the people from Grounds of Health, and I'm not part of this part of Grounds for Health, went forward. They do work with a coffee co op before they ever do any medical training. And that coffee co-op then starts spreading the word over the next six months while they're also deciding who the people being trained are going to be. Then they bring in all the trainers and they do a training. Then they send them back. Then they bring them again and they do a small training connected to the first actual project of screening women. So that's the way they do it. And it's all through people in the villages that support or that are supported work-wise by the coffee co-op being in that surrounding area. It may not be everyone in the family is working for the coffee co-op, but the village presence is that this coffee co-op does hire many, many people for the plantation work. Remember, that's seasonal work. So there are times where they're, cat where they're harvesting beans and there are times where they're not harvesting beans. So it's working around the communities that that coffee co-op says, this is where we get our plantation workers from. But it's very hard. And it's really hard when you also say, and most of you guys, if you have HIV for sure, we really want you to come. Because then who's the person that doesn't have HIV that says, I want to go too. But you know what? It's the mamas. The mamas have seen people die of cervix cancer. They get it. They want to bring people in. What I found that one little niche that I felt like we didn't grab hold of is I wish every one of those mothers had brought their daughter so at least they could get used to the idea of screening or could have some education during the day that everybody sat there waiting to be screened before everybody went home, you know. Um, around safe sex, around what is HPV, around what is your body, about empowering young women to know their body. You know, about menstruation, about HIV, we could have offered. There was a question of whether to offer HIV testing at the same time because we didn't want too much of the stigma link. We thought people would forget, would refuse to come. But in the future, bring your daughter and we'll vaccinate, maybe. You know? Any other questions? Uh, is this a, just a one-off, or was there a rotation where they would come back around? 
Yeah, great question. So it's not, it's meant to be for those women, a, you get screened and if you're normal, we want you to go now to this person we trained at your little village three years from now. If you were treated with cryo that day, you're gonna return to now the person we trained in your little village one year from now. Grounds for Health has returned to this place three times now to assess the ongoing work, but they do not plan to be there continuously. So now it is up for the person who learn the training to teach the next person to teach the next person to teach the next person. And they are trying to work on a national training program for VIA for even the primary non-physician interns that work throughout Africa. So then will they still pay for all the supplies that the people need even though they won't be actually there? Yeah, the basic supplies to start with are supplies they're supposed to keep. So that when we talk about so what I wonder about is does it, how do you, how do you fix that coposcope that, be, I mean, how do you fix that cryo gun that is definitely going to break in three years? How's Grounds for Health funded? Yeah, so Grounds for Health is mostly funded, this is part of my little thing, but Grounds for Health is mostly funded, um, they have four different charitable groups. The big charitable groups, the people that donate more than 20,000 a year, are mostly coffee companies here in America. And then they go to the mid group, which are smaller coffee companies or coffee establishments. Um, and then they go to private donors and then friends. Because I look through that too. I didn't look before I went, I looked afterwards. What would he say? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I I think he would be a, a see and one visit treat guy. So I think I think farmer would be like he gets that tons of steps is not going to work. If I have to ask people to come back over and over again, I think it would be very against the single doc going in, screening 500 women, taking their pap smears home, bringing them back, trying to find those women, treat or not treat, maybe it's five years before you get back. I, I think it would be very against that. So I think he, I think that the idea of see and treat is good, but I think also in my heart of hearts it would be Vaccine, 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 vaccine. I don't, you don't think so? I think Paul Farmer probably does this in his places that he writes. Yes. I would bet he does. Yeah. yeah. But he, he does not emphasize sustainability nor scale. He doesn't, yeah. Okay. He'll operate a castle where he works. Where he works, yeah. But I also think, being a cynic here, this um, represent, this is typical of uh, an NGO that is designed based on where it can get its money and then flavoring it with some public health thing. Yeah. So they got a constituency in the US of US coffee companies that they can get reliable right. funding for. So they design the program around their funding. Right. And that you know, and I it's it's a really interesting thing there because there's there's this newer company people ask me about here and they ask me, Do you want to get involved? And it sounds really great and it's it's that American women in the US here will when we need our tampons, we will go online and we will buy bulk tampons online. And then the money from us buying these tampons online will go to this not-for-profit organization that then understands this importance of keeping women in school in Tanzania or wherever they choose by providing them a way of controlling their menses during the school year. So they don't miss school, they stay educated, they finish school, they go on to college overall improvement of the entire country, more education, right? Sounds great. So I really started, I, they asked me some questions and I said, you know, the place you got to put those tampons if you're going to send them to Tanzania is in every single high school school nurse office. You don't send them home with patients, you send them home with patients or with students, their mamas and their grandmas are going to take them and that kid's still not going to get to go to school in rural Tanzania. And so you got to just leave them in the school and the girls can walk to the office, use it for the day, you know. Um, and they said, oh, no, we've already got some places we're planning on distributing them. 
And the more I learned, this company, even though it's saying they're NGO and has an NGO thing to it, they're more like a company that wants to make money with an NGO kind of save the world thing behind it. And then provide for themselves flexible kind of cool jobs that let them go to and from Africa. It was not, and so I was like, whoa, that is not where my heart lies, you know, even though I'm totally in favor of figuring out a way for women and children in Africa to stay in school, not let menses be what keeps them out of school. So let me just say my five kind of measurabilities now that when I look at something. I look for, do we have measurable outcomes? And Grounds for Health can give you measurable outcomes. They can say, this many people were screened, this many people were treated, and in the future they can actually say within this population the rate of cervical cancer decreased this amount. So I think they're going to have measurable outcomes, okay? Do they plan to scale up? And I'm doing this because of Kimber. Or she, yeah. And so do they plan to scale up? And David, who works for the Nature Conservancy, says when he's looking at smaller projects, he wants to know they're scaling up. That they don't want to just save a tiny little area, quote, save, right? There is no save. Nobody needs saving. But they don't want to help just that one little area. Is the idea to promote overall health within a bigger community and to work with partnerships in corporations or, or NGOs or governments that are already doing this to promote an overall improvement of this healthcare problem at all? And so Council Health says they're scaling up. The way they say they're scaling up is we were in Costa Rica in these three places. Now we're in Tanzania in these two places. Now we're in Ethiopia in this one place. I don't know if I call that scaling up. I call that kind of doing the same exact micro project in a whole bunch of different places. Scaling up to me might be that you, in one place of Tanzania, <clears throat> excuse me, turn into 10 places in Tanzania, turn into 20 places in Tanzania, turn into working with the whole government of Tanzania turns into Tanzania itself making policy around this so that its neighboring company, co countries of Kenya understand and model off them. So a different way of scaling up, maybe. Uh, and that was a baobab tree, right? Giant, giant tree. That's why I said scaling up. Get it? OK. Uh, donor diversity. Get it? No diversity there with those darn zebras. But actually is. Every zebra is different. You just can't see it. So with Grounds for Health, is there donor diversity? Number-wise, there's donor diversity. So it's not one little old lady from Missoula, Montana that wants to help Africa. They got, I don't have to worry that that funding is going to be cut off next year because it's a lot of donors. But it's not diversified when you look at the big, long list because it's really coffee-focused. And that makes me worried for sustainability a little bit, because when coffee's not the next big cool thing, we might not see the support for it. Sustainability without the company or the project or you being there, that word sustainability. So Grounds for Health says we're, we're trying to be sustainable. We're training people that then can train people that then can train people. We're working with the government so they feel like they're training people. I, I get that in concept. I am not convinced Grounds for Health is sustainable if they don't keep going back to do the project work. Um, I'm not convinced that the instrumentation is sustainable. Even in the week long, one of the projects I did, I felt like that cryo gun broke four times. And the only person that could fix it all four times was one of the four of us. And so I was really thinking, I don't know how this is going to work with these guns, even though I like the idea. Uh, the reason I did sustainability is because the Hadza tribe in uh, Dodoma in Tanzania has been there forever, doing everything the way they do it forever. And they are incredible people. And when we would visit and hunt with them, always a line of little old ladies that smoke marijuana all day long and cigarettes, if they can get it, all day long, would come in and say, Joey, listen to me, listen to me. I must have pneumonia. Listen to my lungs, listen to my lungs. And I would listen and I would say, 
oh, mama, you don't have pneumonia, you need to stop smoking, and they would all laugh really hard because it was a big cultural part of their life. And then they would say, give me some of your magic pills, the antibiotics, because some of them probably did need antibiotics, honestly, and I wouldn't because they didn't have a regular health clinic they were going to, which meant they were surviving immune system-wise without someone giving them antibiotics for every single cough and cold they have. And if I started introducing that just when I went to, to visit and hunt with them, I was gonna change their whole immune flora. And then they were gonna need more antibiotics. So I would use antibiotics for the four-year-old that had like fungating otitis media stuff. But all those mamas, no way. And we'd sit and we'd laugh and they'd smoke and I'd say stop smoking and they'd laugh more. <laughs> so that's why I say sustainability. So when you think about that grounds for health and you think about donor diversity, sustainability, scaling up, I have to say my, my gestalt was no. And yet, I loved all the women we worked with. And I loved all the women we trained. And I loved being there that week. I felt kind of good about myself. But if you asked me for long-term support, it didn't quite meet my criteria. And you know what's interesting? Is I didn't really start developing my criteria until I did this and started saying, it doesn't meet my criteria. Now, I work with a guy who goes up to people and asks for $26 million and tries to decide which, my, my husband is constantly deciding which project is good, which is miserable, which is sustainable, which is really going to do the best for the environment and for the wildlife. So I work with this guy who's constantly, and so I'm learning a lot of what he knows now. But this is the first time that I stepped back and said, it's not about making me feel good for a project I did. And is this the way I would want to see? I think it was definitely better than the doctor that would come to the hospital I worked at and collect those 500 pap smears and go home. That drove me, Ugh! But I don't know that this is where I'd put my money. I kind of wonder if I'll put my money into vaccinating. Um, or if I'll put my money into better treatment centers for people who test pot. I'm not sure where I feel about this yet. I wish I had a complete. But I also want to throw out five TED Talk lessons, and Kimber knows I'm a huge TED Talk fan, just like she is. And, and so if you look online, you can find like the top 10 not-for-profit talks you must listen to for TED Talk, just like you can find the top eight women ones and the top whatever. And some of the key points were is, do, does the NGO foster everyday leadership. And I kind of felt like Groundspell Health was trying to do that because they were trying to take people from within a community and train them to then take care of the women. So they were trying that, but I think they missed the mark because I don't think the training was good enough, strong enough, or sustainable itself. Uh, and isn't that a cute picture? Everyday leadership, get that, the hat. I love that one. Um, do they inspire women leaders? I do feel very strongly about this in Africa. When I was working with a sexual assault care center, I felt like the way we would get anywhere is to get the mamas on our side. And if the mamas were on our side, the men became on our side. But I feel very strongly anyone else with experience that can say that, you know, I, I just, that's where I feel like the heart is. Now, the TED Talk says women in NGOs give a different way of thinking, a different way of thinking about the concept of charitable work. So listen to it sometime. You just have to type top eight not-for-profit kind of things. More money for the do-gooders. Those of us that are in not-for-profit work don't need to go over, and I'm telling all of you this, that are choosing something in your life. You don't need to go over and work only in a tiny little hut, get typhoid twice, malaria three times, and you don't need to do any of that to be better at your job. In fact, maybe you'd be better at your job if you went and you stayed in a hotel that gave you potable water that your stomach could handle because you haven't lived there your whole life. And you didn't get malaria, so you didn't have to fly back halfway through your trip. 
or that you got paid for what you did instead of just volunteered. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't volunteer, but I'm just saying NGOs in general should consider paying their directors and their CEOs better than they do because you get actually a better overall product. Um, uh, this physician at uh, Alusha uh, Rusha Lutheran Medical Center gives his heart and soul to surgery and is the most incredible, inspirational person I know and never wants to leave Tanzania. And most Tanzanian, for Tanzania, most educated Tanzanian physicians go to Zimbabwe or go other places where they can make three times their salary. So that's the, good, that's the hospital itself. Dare to disagree. These stupid wildebeests never disagree. If one of them jumps off a cliff and starts swimming across the river to get to the other side, every single one of them follows, even though there are four crocodiles right there and they see their brothers and sisters go down. They keep jumping in and swimming over and jumping in and swimming over there. And us ridiculous tourists sit there and watch it and they're like, oh my God. So dare to disagree because if you disagree, probably better work will be done. With Hot Grounds for Health, there were a couple things I disagreed on. I disagreed on the way they were treating their volunteers. And they were doing it because they said, if our volunteers live so, like, in a very primitive kind of place, then the people we're training will feel exactly equal to them. Well, that is hoo-ha. Those women that we were training understood that we were all going back on a plane to the US and then we had big houses and so there was no benefit in us living in a tiny little wood hut just to show them that we are alike. They are smarter than that. They know that we are alike in some ways and different in some ways. And so three of our people got sick during the project. And so they're just different ways of thinking about that. Dare to disagree and work-life balance. Any of you who choose charitable, organizational, NGO work, right from the day you step through the door to say, I want to volunteer, or I want to work with your incredible organization, say, but I want work-life balance. Because if you don't, your heartstrings will not give it to you because you will lean towards work outbalancing your life. Okay? Grounds for Health, I think, would have made that easy if I kept doing projects with them. I could have gone for a week and come back for a week and gone for two weeks and come back for three months. And so, but it still didn't pull up my heartstrings. And this is us doing yoga with a great German woman uh, in Hadza territory. And all the Hadzas are sitting behind us watching us do the yoga class, smoking their marijuana. That was their work-life balance. <coughs> Stay in the game. Do the leaders of the NGO stay in the game, or do they organize it all, set things in action, and walk away? So when you're looking at an organization, think of that. And all of these are mentioned in those eight TED Talks. So um, here's my family, Ethiopia. This is how close we get. Uh, think about it. Would you support Ground for Health? Would you work for them? And what key points today do you walk away with? Someone give me a key point. Please. Something that you kind of think differently about because of today's talk. Natalie, give me something. Um, work with what you have. Okay. Use your eyes. There you go. Oh, get in their clothes. There you go. So sometimes simplifying the equipment need. Simplifying the equipment need. Maybe that was the best part of this program, was they said, let's not work with those big giant, let's not try to get those big microscopes everywhere. Good. Nothing? Come on. One more. Yeah? I was looking at the leaders of the organizations to that whole stay in the game thing. I don't really think about that. Yeah. Yeah, I live in New York. I'm in the buyout. Organizations work with great together. They're not all around. They're not all around. So I would, I, would, I would challenge you to the next big, hey, do you want to do this project? Or hey, there's this mission here. Or there's two weeks here you can go to. I would just challenge yourself to kind of look through the kind of things that we talked about today and decide, is that an organization you work for? I would, I would challenge you, if you're interested in cervical cancer screening, to figure out the best way of doing it. And then let me know, because I'd love to be part of it. 
but I'm not quite sure we know yet how to do that in places that don't have the same, the same equipment and laboratory stuff we have here. Uh, be adventurous, take risks. I love this one because we actually put him, go take a picture in front of that sign that says beware of crocodiles right behind you. <laughs> like, oh my God. All right, uh, if you would find a pink piece of paper before I just say if there is any more questions, um, I asked at the beginning of the thing, how many people, or tell me what you think, if you're an expat, if you're a, a missionary person, if you're a traveler doing good work somewhere else that is in Africa and you go over there, what's the one thing you need to be most worried about that could cause death? Dysentery. Dysentery. I love that answer. It's completely wrong, but I love it. Yay! So if you wrote motor vehicle accident, raise your piece of paper up. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Turn him over. It's motor vehicle accident. Nobody ever thinks that. And did you see that picture? We were not wearing seat belts early in that thing. I had both kids on my lap like this. We're going all through the roads. If you wrote motor vehicle accident, send it this way. Isn't that funny, people that have lived there a really long time? Yes? No? Anywhere else? Natalie did. She's been in those cars. Yeah. Send it down. Anyone up there? So it's not dysentery, it's not malaria, it's not typhoid, it's not dengue, it's not all that stuff that people worry about, it's that seat belt. It is that ridiculous seat belt. Okay, are any of these people students in the course? Yeah, I know, I know, it's true. Anybody, is, are any of these people that, um, are any of the people that wrote road accidents a student in the course? Oh heavens. Well, I was going to give, you are? And you were, there you go. I'm sorry, I'm not giving it to a non-student. That's your present. There you go. You can have the candy inside too. That's probably made in India, not Africa, even though I bought it in Africa. Okay, I'm opening it up to questions. If you need to leave, feel free to leave. Thanks, guys. So you said that you train um, the women and, you know, to use the visual training. And then if they... If a woman doesn't have any risk, you tell them to come back three years later. How do you continue the education with the already trained women? Because if I am looking at a cervix now and then three years down the road, how do I remember those things? What are you doing to continue that? Education? Yeah, so remember me, um, what you're asking is how is Grounds for Health doing it? Yeah. So, and I would say that's one of the sustainable parts they don't have in place. And I didn't see a plan for it. So it's where I worry there'll be a breakdown once they pull out. Yeah. Um, I don't feel like there's enough government initiative education training right now to sustain that. So, yeah. I've got two questions for you. One is there was a gap in everything you talked about. You never talked about the males and the role of the males in all this. There must be something that we need to work with with that. Yeah. The other question is what did you bring back that you can use here from your experience in that? Uh, in all of Africa or this project? Yes. Okay, I'll say, well, I'll just start with this project I brought back that I can actually do visual inspection, uh, what I call the poor man's coposcope, here a lot. So when I have women who have an abnormal pap smear and they say, I can't afford a coposcope, I now say, let me put vinegar on your cervix and just look. And that is a tiny little nothing visit. And it's not as good as the magnifying glass. Um, I actually pull out my coposcope most of the time because I'm in a clinic where nobody says, did you use the machine? Charge the money. But, but I, I use visual inspection a, a lot now on my patients. Or if I had someone who's having their second pap because the first pap was abnormal, I will put vinegar on after that pap, the second pap, just so I can already give them kind of a heartfelt what my gut will be if that pap is normal or not normal. And it's just so easy to do. What did I bring back from Africa this time? Um, compared to Peace Corps, every time I go to Africa, the thing I bring back is how blessed my life is, without a doubt, which who doesn't come back um, and say that I have a, a beautiful Hadza woman that let her picture be taken that was part of an art um, show in Tanzania by Dodoma and um, supporting some tribal work there. And um, she hangs above my desk so that every day, as frustrated as I get sometimes with patients, or if I have that patient that's like, oh, my big toe hurts again, and, and you know, and I'm thinking, ah, 
I can look at her and remember I'm blessed. So most of us that have traveled abroad kind of get that. And that the world's a lot bigger then. And what was the other question about? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Grounds for Health did not, the only place I saw male involvement was the coffee co-op. Because they, they run the coffee co-ops, not the women. And, but I felt like their involvement, the male coffee co-op owners that were out kind of saying, yes, we're going to educate and all this, I felt like their involvement was because here's a big pocket of money coming to them to enrich their business. It could have been that we went in coffee co-op and said we're going to do new schools or coffee co-op and we're going to uh, do cataract surgery. And they would have been just as excited about it. So I, I think they didn't get cervical cancer as being an issue. But it was, yeah, if that's the health thing that we need to be involved with for us to be able to get better. And the coffee co-op part was great. Fair trade for coffee and those workers and their employees and the businesses is great. But I do think in every public health project, and especially I saw this in the sexual assault program that I worked in, if we didn't involve the males, even though we involved the mamas first, if you didn't involve the males, I mean, we had 13 year, old, 13 year olds come to the clinic all the time. They couldn't get to the clinic unless the father had agreed. And so there had to be education within the communities with the fathers, um, which we see here. When we talk about domestic violence here, some of, some of the best programs involve men who say, I don't want my daughter or sister to be involved in domestic violence. And that's why I'm a, I'm a proponent of education and fighting against that. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I was just uh, being involved with nonprofits uh, myself. And, uh, this, that ink in the ocean kind of feeling that you have of, you know, the efficacy of it. The, the, uh, I think it's lovely to kind of think locally and, of course, act, uh, pardon me, act locally and think globally. And, and with, the, with the coffee, uh, that's a relatively small population of Tanzania in the sense that most are, are pastoral mm -hmm. or have their agricultural little farms in you know, really non-organized fashions like the co-op for coffee, which is a perfect model because that's kind of one would argue what you need right. to actually be effective. So I love it as a, a model. What I wanted to ask this long-winded question was, how do you get past, or how would you see any organization for the vast majority of Tanzanians, for instance, that are really rural, really pastoral, really out there on their own? Yeah, because this didn't hit any of the Maasai community. Yeah. It, it didn't hit, yeah, it didn't hit Hadza. It didn't. Um, and there have been discussions of this, that that works. Are, are, are any parallel models that anyone has thought of that would reach out with a similar effectiveness, but in a very... Yeah, I am certain that there are people much smarter than me that are thinking on that, and I don't know what the answer is. I know Grounds for Health wasn't there. And I think that's part of where I pulled away, thinking that I want this to be bigger, or I want it to be different, and I'm, but I don't really know that I have the answer to it. I have easier answers here in the States when I think about transferring reproductive rights or long-acting contraception to rural communities here. I'm like, it's all about teaching the residents. If I can teach the young doctors that are going to be my rural docs, then they're going to go out and do this stuff, you know? I have a little more trouble there because there's such a disconnect in socioeconomical levels, which is only getting greater and greater and such a disconnect on who has internet and who doesn't have internet, you know, and uh, who can travel to the big hospitals and which big hospitals get the money and which ones don't get the money. Um, so I, I don't know that that is, I, they, definitely Grounds for Health is not considering that. And I had to drive one of my graduate students to that very hospital two years ago. Oh, in Moshi? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. We certainly, certainly uh, had a great He's discussion done. today and uh, gone on a little bit long, so I want to uh, end the discu formal discussion and invite you to come up and talk to Joey more if you'd like to. But, uh, you know, I especially appreciate the, the great detail of your presentation tonight. And I think, uh, you know, it really was giving us a grassroots look at, at things. And uh, aside from the specific topic of cervical cancer, I think you really 
uh, showed us what it's like to work in, in Africa, and I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, so, um, before we give Joey a round of applause to thank her, I want to mention that next week, Roger Furlong is going to be talking about global blindness, impacts and emerging solutions. So that's where we're going next week. But please join me in thanking Joey for the wonderful